morning, friends. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. We gather for worship today and we are reminded of the early church. We're reminded how difficult life became for them, but we also see what great courage they had, what great faith they showed, what amazing confidence in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. As we prepare our hearts for worship, we do so prayerfully that we would emulate some of their faith and courage and hope. Let us worship God. Thank you. 
This is Defender by Rita Springer. Come back with the head of my enemy You come back and you call it my victory You go You've even gone to win my war Your love becomes my greatest defense It leads me from the dry wilderness And all I did was praise All I did was worship Friends, Paul exhorts the church to pray without ceasing. Even as we gather online, it is important that we go to our Lord together in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, on this Mother's Day, we give thanks for mothers. Thank you for all the mothers who gave birth to us and the women who loved us like their own children. You are the fulfillment of a mother's love, and you show us how to love unconditionally. Fill us with your love, joy, and peace, and help us raise our children to be the people you have called them to be. Comfort us, Lord, because some of us are missing mothers who have passed into eternal life. We pray for soothing of the deep sorrow of those mothers missing their children, parted by distance or death. Comfort all who have bravely given up their child for adoption when they knew it was for the best. Comfort those who longed to give birth and could not. Healing God, we pray for those here whose mothers have disappointed them. 
We ask for grace in relationships where there is pain and bitterness, for healing in relationships where there is abuse and violence. Help our congregation to be a space where people can feel mothered, their gifts and talents appreciated and nurtured. Finally, we pray today for struggling mothers, mothers who cannot feed their children, mothers who are homeless, mothers who cannot keep their children safe from violence, mothers who are overwhelmed trying to work from home and teach their children. Help us create a world where mothers can raise their children in peace and plenty. We pray these prayers knowing that Jesus cared well for his mom. Even in his dying, he provided for her. We pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. from John 14, verses 1 through 7 and 25 through 27. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, 
so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going? Thomas said to him. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do let, not let them be afraid. Good morning. Today's lesson comes from Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Sicilia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. They then secretly investigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the peoples as well as the elders and the scribes, then suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, this man never stopped saying things against the holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, Are these things so? And Stephen replied, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are not the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravishing the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, we read about the earliest church. Signs and wonders put them in awe. They worshiped and ate together with glad and generous hearts. God added to their number day by day. Their numbers grew to the level that organization was necessary. Stephen was elected the first deacon in the church. The role of deacons was, among other duties, to serve the poor by distributing food to the widows. Stephen was extraordinary in his duties and people took notice. He apparently talked a lot about Jesus, much to the dismay of the synagogue leaders, and so they recruit false witnesses to discredit him. He's brought before the Sanhedrin, gives the worst received sermon ever, and the crowd stones him to death. Stephen, the first deacon, becomes the first martyr. The storm that had been gathering force in the beginning chapters of Acts now reaches full force. 
A wide-scale persecution of the church began, led by a member of the Sanhedrin named Saul. He goes door to door, rounding up those who dare invoke the name of Jesus and takes them to prison. These are difficult days for the fledgling church of Jesus Christ. They're difficult days ahead for us too. What does recovery from COVID-19 look like? When will we get to the elusive phase three when churches can meet? How many businesses will make it? And what about the church? The mainline church has been in decline for decades. Will this wake us up or hasten our demise? Christians are not immune from the troubles of this world. Quite the opposite. Jesus promised that in this world we will have trouble. Some of us may face illness in the days ahead, physical, mental, or emotional. Some of us may be hit with injustices. This world is not fair. People we love will die, and our own sin causes us a whole lot of trouble. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. The natural and frequent question is why? Why does God allow us to suffer in these ways, especially if we love God, follow Jesus, and faithfully use the gifts the Spirit has given us? Why do these things happen? I don't know the answer to that question, but there are a few things I do know. First of all, I know that it is when we have hit rock bottom and there is nowhere to look but up that we can finally see God. It's trouble that causes me to seek God more than any other thing when I have finally run out of options. I am forced to turn to the one for whom nothing is impossible. When Stephen looked up, he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at God's right hand. Wow. Secondly, I know that when difficult days come, that I am in good company. Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Jesus, Stephen, just to name a few. The many people are drawn in today's world to the love and grace of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. But there is also something in this world that hates the ways and love of God. They're offensive, going against our instincts for survival and success. The world reacts in hostile ways to the challenges of doing things God's way. The synagogue leaders couldn't stand the wisdom and spirit with which Stephen spoke. The Sanhedrin became enraged and ground their teeth after Stephen's testimony. And third, I know that no matter what is going on in our world, we are called to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. The word martyr is a transliteration of the Greek word for witness. Jesus told his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It is trouble that brings forth our strongest witness. It is the difficult days that give us an opportunity to testify for what we, to what we believe. Stephen's trouble gave him an audience. Yes, it was a hostile audience, but it was an audience nonetheless. Saul was in that audience approving this hostile activity. It will not be long before Saul switches sides. Stay tuned for next week's sermon. History has shown us that the church grows in times of persecution. The church stagnates when it enjoys the comfort of acceptance. We are called to be witnesses to what we know and believe about Jesus, and our witness is stronger and more credible in times of trouble. As I read the story of Stephen, I hear the Spirit ask my spirit, Tracy, to what are you willing to witness, even to your death? Whether I am killed in a wave of persecution for my faith, am taken by some dreaded disease, 
or die in my sleep at a ripe old age. My end is not for me to choose or even for me to know. To what will I testify with my last breath? For me, it is found in our John reading for today. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Everything of worth is by him and through him and in him and all about him. I'm convinced of his great love for you and for me, for everyone. I am sticking with him because he always sticks with me and no trouble can or ever will take him away from me. No persecution, no injustice, no illness, no tragedy this world can bring. Nothing can separate me from his love. There are some watching and listening today who remember when Paul Harvey would tell us the rest of the story. I now know the rest of the story about one of our favorite Christian poems. On Monday, August 7th, 1989, Paul and Margie Powers headed up to Golden Nears Park in British Columbia to picnic at the Lower Falls at the behest of their daughter Paula and her kids. Margie threw on her swimsuit and shorts and almost cleaned the pockets out of her zip-up jacket, but decided not to take the time to do so. She felt the bottle of Paul's heart pills and a bottle of extra-strength Tylenol residing there and wondered why she hauled around so much stuff. The rocks across the top of the lower falls were slippery, Paula warned everyone. There was a 40-foot deep glacier pool off one side. Some visitors to the park dove into the glacier pool from high atop the rocks. Not them. It was too high and too cold. Paul elected to stay on the safe side of the falls and read. The rest made their way across and enjoyed the beautiful scenery. After a while, Paula decided to go back across and join her dad. She started out over the rock ledge and lost her footing. She fell into a whirlpool of water. It sucked her into its its vortex, spun her around and out and over the falls. Everyone was screaming. Margie jumped to her feet and was screaming too. Just then she glanced across at her husband and saw him clutch his chest and fall. At that moment, she knew he was having a heart attack. She could see his color change. It felt like all this was happening in slow motion. Margie prayed, oh God, help us. She thought her daughter was dead and she knew she had to get to her husband. As Margie struggled to get to Paul, she slipped on the rocks and broke her arm. It was just then that a stranger's voice called out, I'm going to throw this rope. My son is alongside you. He'll grab it. Hang on to the rope as you go across. That man's wife was a nurse who was at that very moment administering CPR to Paul. In excruciating pain, Margie remembered the Tylenol in her pocket and Paul's heart medicine. The nurse was able to give it to Paul. Down below, some visitors on the rocks at the base of the fall saw a body floating by. Thinking it was a corpse, they pulled it ashore. A woman rushed over and immediately began resuscitative efforts on Paula. There's more to this story, but they all made it to the hospital, Paul and Paula in critical condition. The next morning, Paul's ICU nurse came over to greet him when his eyes opened. She asked, would you like me to pray for you and your daughter and your wife? He nodded yes. When she finished praying, she said, I think it would be helpful to read you a poem I have in my pocket. Holding Paul's hand, she read, One night I had a dream. I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. When the last scene of my life shot before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. There was only one set of footprints at the lowest and saddest times in my life. This bothered me, and I questioned the Lord about my dilemma. 
Lord, you told me when I decided to follow you, you would walk and talk with me all the way. But I'm aware that during the most troublesome times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. I just don't understand why, when I needed you most, you leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. When the nurse finished reading, she looked at Paul and said, I don't know its author, it's anonymous. Paul lifted his head and weakly said, I do, I know the author. The nurse thought he was confused because of all the medications, but Paul said again, I know the author very well. She's my wife. Yes, Margie Powers had written what we know as Footprints in 1964 and called it One Night I Had a Dream because of a dream she really had. When Paul told her about the nurse reading it to him, she was overwhelmed that something she had written so long ago was now being used by a nurse who didn't even know them to speak peace to their hearts. With her husband and daughter in intensive care, with her arm in a cast, the landscape of their lives seemed overshadowed by a dark sky. Yet they knew from past experience that during this troublesome time, they would be carried. God had carried them before. He would carry them now. My friends, that is the promise. Not that we will escape all persecution, hardship, illness, or death. The promise is that we will be carried, that we will never be left or forsaken by God. Be strong and courageous, God tells Joshua before Joshua leads the people into the promised land. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We have an advocate, God's Holy Spirit, with us every step of the way. This is not a spirit of fear, Paul, the former Saul, proclaims, but a spirit of love and of power and of self-discipline. Even though he slay me, I will trust him, the long-suffering Job insists. I know that my Redeemer lives, and even when my flesh is destroyed, I shall see God, whom I will see on my side. Jesus assures us that he has gone to prepare a place for us so that where he is, we may be also. My friends, there may be difficult days ahead for all of us. So the next time you feel alone, remember Margie's dream. The next time you're in a dark place, remind yourself, Jesus loves me. I don't ever have to be troubled or afraid. As you lay dying, whisper, Jesus went to prepare a place so that I may be where he is. And look up, for you just may see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Amen. Life. When trouble comes, there's a place we can go. We can hide the promises that when trouble comes, it's when we grow. today there's peace in the middle the middle the middle of the storm in this world we never
never know when your time has come. But we can be sure that when it's time, we'll have peace of mind. That the battle's won Peace in the middle of the storm Peace in the middle of the storm Winds of change may blow you away There's peace in the middle of the storm Peace in the middle of the storm there's peace in the middle of the storm This mercy's new for us today There's peace in the middle, the middle, the middle of the storm
God who is able to do beyond what we can ask or even imagine be all honor and glory and power. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen.